Hey guys, Tyler here. We've all heard it. The opening to your favorite, or even your least favorite, Star Trek episode, in which a Starfleet officer, usually a captain, records a log entry about the latest antics that their ship or crew has gotten into. They usually start off said entry with a star date, a unit of measuring time employed by the Federation and other societies, usually expressed as a specific number of digits followed by a decimal point. These star dates act as stand-ins for real-world dates, like March 18th, 2222, or the like. Star dates are used in seven of the ten Star Trek television series and most of the films. The format for star dates has varied over the years, of course, with unique formats in the original series and the Next Generation eras, respectively, as well as a new system devised for the Kelvin Timeline films. Methods for calculating star dates have not always been easy to crack, making them one of the most hotly debated subjects among Star Trek fans. In this video, I'd like to explore the history of star dates as they've been used in Star Trek and examine how useful they'd be for measuring time in our universe. Let's get started. Chronologically, the earliest use of star dates in the Star Trek timeline actually comes from the prequel series Enterprise. While Starfleet in the mid 22nd century does not use star dates, opting instead for Gregorian calendar dates, the Vulcans and the Zindi both appear to be at least familiar with the concept. This means there may be some objective astronomical metric that can be used to calibrate star dates, and such measurements can be translated across cultures with presumably different counting systems. Indeed, when devising star dates for the original series, which of course takes place over a century after Enterprise, Gene Roddenberry and his writing team wanted a system that was completely divorced from the normal progression of dates on Earth. First used in the episode Where No Man Has Gone Before, TOS's second pilot, star dates were adapted from a method used by real astronomers to calculate the time between between events called a Julian day. A Julian day number is an integer assigned to an entire solar day that has elapsed since noon on January 1st, 4713 BC on the Julian calendar, which corresponds to November 24th, 4714 BC on the Gregorian calendar. This is the date that three multi-year cycles, the indiction, solar, and lunar cycles, all started simultaneously, and it precedes any other dates in recorded human history. For example, the Julian day number for the day starting at noon universal time on January 1st, 2000, is 2,451,545. Most astronomers, however, use only the last five digits, and for Star Trek, Roddenberry borrowed the Julian system and shortened it to four digits, renaming it the star date. He brought in Sam Peoples, who wrote the script for Where No Man Has Gone Before, to help him devise a method for calculating star dates. According to journalist Joel Engel in his book Gene Roddenberry, The Myth and the Man Behind Star Trek, the two men, quote, marked off sections on a pictorial depiction of the known universe and extrapolated how much Earth time would elapse when traveling between given points. They took into account that the Enterprise's engines would violate the laws of relativity which hold that nothing can travel faster than light. They thus concluded that the time continuum would be different from place to place and would always defer from Earth time. Scientifically, there is some truth to this as objects orbiting large gravity wells, such as very massive black holes, experience a form of time dilation. Think of the movie Interstellar, in which, for every hour that passes on a planet orbiting Gargantua, years pass for the rest of the universe. But notice I said, the rest of the universe. That's because across most of space, time runs at effectively the same rate. This is because the laws of physics are what is called 
isotropic, meaning that they are uniform in all directions and only start to break down when crossing the event horizons of black holes. The way the fundamental forces manifest, the behavior of subatomic particles in an electrical field, the nuclear energy that binds stars together, and the gravitational constant that keeps galaxies from falling apart is the same 40 billion light years away as it is here. It is true that satellites orbiting the Earth must periodically reset their clocks to remain geosynchronous, but the difference is very small compared to the actual time dilation experienced by objects traveling close to the speed of light. It's like splitting hairs over the speed at which your feet age versus your head. The differential's there, but it's, it's basically negligible. So given all of this, What's the point in using stardates anyway? To which I would say, man, good question. Well, regardless of their scientific accuracy, they were originally invented to avoid having to mention the century that Star Trek the original series took place in. Indeed, in Roddenberry's initial pitch for the original series, the show was said to take place sometime between 1999 and 2999. That's Incredibly specific, Gene, thank you. Sometime between 30 and 1,000 years after the British invasion. Anyway, the point was to avoid arguments over whether certain technologies would have been invented or even superseded by the year, say, 2265. Episodes were given star dates consisting of four digits, like 1312, followed by a decimal point and a tenths digit, such as 0.5. Each tenths digit is roughly equivalent to a tenth of a day. Since episodes were aired out of order compared to the order that they were filmed, fans started to complain that star dates were inconsistent, if you can believe that. Giving rise to the explanation that star dates can go up or down depending on the Enterprise's physical location in the galaxy. In the Next Generation era, the star date system was revised, this time using a format of five digits followed by a decimal. Most episodes of TNG use the following formula. The first digit is four, indicating the 24th century. The second digit is the season number. And the last three digits progress consecutively throughout the season from 000 to 999. The digit after the decimal point represents, once again, tenths of a day. Because of the way this formula is set up, TNG star dates were never designed to precisely correlate to Earth dates. In fact, one issue with the system is that roughly a thousand days would elapse within a year. Also, during the runs of DS9 and Voyager, the first digit rolls over to five, meaning that in-universe, the first digit can't stand for any uh, century on the Gregorian calendar, because both of those shows still take place in the 24th century. Indeed, production staffers and fans alike have both been not so reluctant to point out that there are ambiguities inherent in stardate calculation, even within singular episodes. The system devised by Roberto Orci and Alex Kurtzman for the Kelvin Timeline movies honestly makes more sense than any of the aforementioned counterparts. These star dates simply begin with a Gregorian calendar year, like 2233 or 2258, followed by three digits after a decimal point to indicate days of the year out of 365. For example, Spock's log entry after the destruction of Vulcan is recorded on star date 2258.42, and the commissioning of the jellyfish, according to the ship's computer, is stardate 2387, meaning that this new system may have also been introduced, at least temporarily, in the Prime Universe. Of course, in the screenplay for Star Trek 09, when asked the stardate in the opening scene of the film, Captain Robau says 223304, though Orchie has said that the inclusion of a zero after the decimal point was an error. Regardless, it's clear that the intention behind this revision of the stardate system was to make stardate easier to understand, which I think is not at all a bad thing. In fact, Michael Chabon, showrunner of Star Trek Picard, eschewed stardates altogether. He stated in an Instagram story, Stardates, in my view, are a uniquely perverse form of uninformative information. 
using a star date tells you precisely nothing. Even people who know how to interpret and convert them have to go off and interpret and convert them to have them mean something. Giving an audience the star date is like I wanted to know if I needed to put on a sweater or not, and you told me the temperature outside in Kelvin. It's 287 out. No matter what you think about Michael Chabon, I think he's absolutely right. I think this was the right call. Stardates are unnecessarily confusing and uninformative. Even if the franchise embraced a format like Unix time, the number of seconds that have elapsed since January 1st, 1970, widely used in a lot of operating systems, it still wouldn't serve the purpose that a log entry is supposed to fulfill. This is why I think that Star Trek productions going forward Forward ought to follow suit and commit to a different form of time measurement that's more coherent. Whether it's Gregorian calendar dates, which I assume would be used anyway in various contexts by Earth authorities being that it's the Federation's capital planet, or the number of days since the launch of a ship's particular mission, either of these would be more useful, I think, than pesky star dates. And that's where I stand. Or sit, in this case. Even if stardates were originally invented for a more valid purpose, to avoid mentioning Star Trek's century and avoid arguments over whether certain technologies would have been invented by then, it's more useful, I think, to embrace the fact that Star Trek is a fictional piece of media, believe it or not, that just takes place hundreds of years in humanity's future. Just tell good stories, and I promise you that the audience will suspend disbelief as necessary. Speaking of disbelief, I bet you can't believe the reasonable prices of the apparel over at the Orange River Productions merch store, link in the description. We've got a new line of t-shirts featuring the Orange River logo in the style of different sci-fi franchises like Star Trek, as well as Mass Effect and Metroid, as well as a custom-made mycelial network in-joke t-shirt designed by my good friend CJ Studio 1000. Follow him on Instagram and follow me while you're at it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, becoming a patron or a member is a great way to do so. Links to those, as well as my social media and merch store, are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.